Okay, I'll get started. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Hands up if you can't hear me. Yes, good. Okay. Um, so I wanted to have a quick show of hands and or make sure you're woken up first by asking, uh, how many people know what SVG is? Okay, lots of people. Good. How many people have written any SVG, produced any SVG using a program, Inkscape, something like that? Yes, lots of people. Okay. Uh, how many people have produced a print publication of any sort with SVG? Fewer, but good. Okay. Uh, how many people know what color management is at all? I know you've had two talks, but how many actually? <laughs> okay, good. How many people have no clue really what it does and why they would need it? Yeah, right. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is SVG2. And why SVG2? Because SVG1 is basically done. Uh, SVG1 is what you're using now. It's in all the major browsers. I can say that now because last year Microsoft finally decided to stop producing stupid things like Silverlight. This is being recorded, right? Stop producing stupid things like Silverlight and get with the program and implement SVG like everyone else, which was nice, finally. Uh, so Inkscape and things like that, export it. Things like Scribus or Scribus, I can never remember which, import it, which is fine. So that's what we have now. So now we're, we're starting to produce something the next version. So let's look at what you can do already in 1.1 in SVG. All of the colors are in sRGB. That means they're not some random who knows what it is RGB, but they're actually in a specific color space. How many people know what sRGB is? Very few. Okay, it is a small Color small gamut profile. It's meant to represent standard screens, if there was such a thing, in 1998 or so, which meant it was a cathode ray tube. It was not an LCD, but it was a reasonable thing. Actually, the gamut was based on what you use for high definition television now, so it wasn't too bad a choice. And the gamma is set to 2.2, which is again not a bad choice, as it turns out, so it's fine. Why does it matter? Why does it matter what color space it's in? Because when you go to print, or when you start adding other color space stuff and mixing it in, you need to know what the result is of overlaying, say, something in sRGB with something that's in Adobe RGB or some CMYK or whatever. You need to know what it is. So we already have that. We already have the same sort of form. So, so if you know how to do CSS, how many people do CSS for their web pages? Yes, lots, right, good. All of those forms for doing color, you know, hash one, two, three, and all that stuff. Um, they all work in SVG. You can also do ICC profiles. Uh, you can say, here's a color, and then here's the ICC version of that color. So you've got a fallback, but you've also got the ICC version. So the good thing is we got that in version one, and the bad thing is it was optional, which meant that people like Adobe or Corel implemented it, but they did plugins and we don't use them anymore. And then people like the browser guys went, that's optional, we're not doing it. Cool. So, um, so that's one. So what do we have next? Oh yes, still, still staying with SVG 1.1, interpolation and compositing. When you overlay two colors and one of them is transparent and you want to find out what the result is, that calculation happens in sRGB space. You can either do sRGB with a gamma curve or you can do it linear. Linear is better. It may be slightly slower but it actually gives you a result that makes sense, that gives you the color that you would actually expect looking at those two colors, what should the result be? It also means that colors are gamut clipped to sRGB. Remember I just said that you could have ICC colors, you can have some CMYK, whatever? Yep, and as soon as you try and overlay it, if it's outside the sRGB gamut, it gets brought inside because that's the space it's working with. Also, filters, you know, for f fancy filter effects, they also work in linear sRGB. So that's a problem. It's good for the stuff that, that's sort of normal stuff, but if, as soon as you start getting a bit beyond that, it's a problem. So, in SVG2, first of all, good news is we're keeping everything that's in SVG1. Things aren't going to be going away. We're going to have explicit conformance classes, so you can, instead of saying, I'm not doing that optional feature, it becomes a mandatory, it becomes a mandatory feature, ignore that cane, um, but you have to say which conformance class you fit into, so we'll have sort of high quality, low quality type classes, and you can decide what you, you fit in with. Uh, the idea is that we're going to use an ICC workflow because that's what the industry uses. 
That's pretty much an obvious conclusion until you start talking to people who work in the film industry, in which case they say, oh no, actually you should be using massively wide uh, XYZ and you should be using our special transfer function or whatever, and no, that doesn't work with ICC profiles. And we'll go, that's great, we'll, we'll look at that for version 3, but for version 2 we're going to stick with ICC. What does it add? It adds a bunch of things there which I'm not going to read out because A, you can read, and B, they're on all the next slides. So, I won't bother. The other thing, and this is a question for those in the audience that have an opinion, um, preferably an informed one. Uh, ICC version 2 or version 4, which should we go for? Originally I was thinking version 4 because that's so much better and there's this thing on the ICC site that tells you all the things that version 2 can't do and that version 4 can do. Then you find out that in practice, especially for screens, ICC version 2 works just fine, thank you. Uh, so I don't know. <coughs> Any thoughts? <coughs> Excuse me. Yep. continue. So first thing we want to do in SVG2 is to support tagged images. If you produce something with your camera and you maybe export it in Adobe sRGB space or even in a wider gamut thing, um, you probably expect it to look like what it looks like on your screen when you share it with other people on the web. And you'll probably be sadly disappointed. And you'll probably start posting to forums saying the web browsers are doing it all wrong. And the web browser guys will probably say, point me to the spec that says we have to do it the obvious and simple way that you would expect. And you go, ah, yes, actually we don't say that anywhere. Well, we will now. So that's one thing, because there are actually quite a lot of that. And it's not just people who are color geeks or know all about color. It's people who have a digital camera that has some reasonable pretension of quality and they like to have what they see actually visible to other people. So that's one thing. Linking to profiles. So the idea is you can link to a color profile. There's some syntax there. The first bit is in XML and the second bit is in CSS. And you can use whichever one you feel comfortable with because they both do the same thing. All it does is point to a color profile and say which rendering intent to use. Um, you'll notice, by the way, <coughs> that the X-Link colon is gray there. That's because in SVG2 we're getting rid of all that stuff about X-Link colon. You don't have to type that anymore. It's really annoying and it didn't actually get you anything. So ICC color, same as before. You always have to provide an sRGB fallback, always. So there is something that can be displayed and, the, for example, Something might not understand the profile, or it might not understand this particular color space that you're using, or the profile not be, might not be there, it might be a 404. So we have to have a fallback. We also allow you to directly specify a color in LAB. So that's easy, that's fine. If you have a spectrophotometer and you have one of these things where you say measure, you know, that purple on that, that desk, it'll give you a value in LAB. So being able to just type that in is great. So that's easy, but what do you do actually? Uh, what does LAB mean? LAB is always relative to a particular white, okay? When you measure things in X, Y, Z, you've got some three-dimensional coordinate space with all of the colors out there, and they, they're just like that. And white is some axis coming out like this. LAB makes that the sort of central axis, that's the lightness axis, and it's always tied to that. So you have to say which white you mean. If you use LAB in something like Photoshop, if you say change mode to LAB, what you get is LAB with a D50 white point. 
If you convert between two different color spaces using the ICC, and if it uses LAB as a profile connection space, that is LAB with a D50 white point. So the obvious simple thing is to say it's D50, D50 is what you get, you can have any, any white point you want as long as it's D50. That's one thing. But of course people aren't going to like that, they're going to say, huh, um, I'm doing this in Adobe RGB, which uses a D65 white point, and I'd like to export it to sRGB, which is a D65 white point. Why do I have to go through D50 first? That's two sets of chromatic adaptation transforms. How, who knows what a chromatic adaptation transform is? One, two, okay. Right, it's real simple. You pick up a piece of white paper, you look at it, it's white. In this room, it's white. You go outside, it's white. Take a photograph in each of those places and it will be orange, blue, all sorts of things. Your eye has adapted to decide that this thing here is probably white. Which is simple, but it means all the other colors have sort of dragged along with it. And it's the effect of dragging those colors towards a new white, that's chromatic adaptation. And yeah, it turns out the math is quite simple, it's just a 3 by 3 matrix, it's not hard, but you have to actually do that. The consequences of not doing it are bad. By the way, funny story. Um, you know the Adobe RGB color space? You know how this got such a huge gamut compared to SIGB, which is kind of crap? Actually, that's not true. The only thing that's different is the green. And the reason that the green is way out there is because they picked the NTSC green primary and they forgot that it was relative to a different white point. Illuminant C, or Illuminant A even, I think. Uh, and if they'd adapted it, it would have had a much smaller gamma. But then, having produced such a thing by accident, they found they liked it, so they kept it. Ah, there we are. So, and, and at the bottom, there's an example. Um, so in this case, I'm using the second option, where you have three, LAB, three values for LAB, and then a fourth parameter, which says which white point you use. One obvious option is to say, well, you can have D50, D65, D58, which is what Flash uses, Illuminant A, F, which is sort of strip lights, there is things like that. And a third and most complicated one is to say you can have anything you want, you just give the XYZ coordinates of the white, which gives you the greatest flexibility. It would probably please Graham Gill, and lots of people would say, how do I do that? And we would have to tell them. Yes? I guess the, the major, yeah, the, the major use case I think is I have measured this. I've measured it with this particular illuminant. I want to express that in my file. I don't want to have it, you know, for round tripping or whatever. I want to express, specify it in the file and then have it rendered as best you can. Whether that's a big thing or whether we should say no, actually, Here's a little online converter, type in your LEB values, we'll, we'll whack it over, through, stick a Bradford transform on it, and, and there's your result. I'm actually tending much more now, since I wrote these slides, which were a couple of months ago actually, uh, towards saying, no, it's D50 and that's what you get. Would anyone, would anyone really sort of like be leaping out of windows if I did that and say, oh my god, I can't use the Fuji 2 anymore? No? Okay. Sold. Sorry? Why not just have XYZ? We could. Uh, why would you want that? You you want that instead of LAB or, or right? And then you don't need to know what the white point is. Ah, oh, nice one. Yeah, that's true. Then we don't have to give. I was imagining writing some appendix in the SVG spec that explained how to go from all of these different standard whites to D15. No, that's that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's do that. All right. It does, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. That was why we were tending to go for the more complicated approach. But equally... Hmm. Right. So the other thing we can do is named colors. Um, we already have a type of named colors, which is the X11 named colors. You know, we have these things like Alice Blue and Navajo White and whatever, which I can never remember what colors they are, and they never actually help me. What people really want, though, is to say Pantone this, or Toyo that, or 
here's a set of 20 colors that we've produced with our designers and our focus team and that's what our branding is going to use and we want to call them things like super powerful yellow or something and type that in your SVG, super powerful yellow. So that's what you do here. You have a, a, a named ICC profile and it, basically instead of giving it numbers you give it a text string and it looks it up, which is great. Uh, and it's an obvious way, international standards way, to interchange color swatches and stuff. The only problem with that, are you aware of any software that makes such a thing? Not exactly sure about that one. I know that there are various open source projects to produce swatches in various formats or to import some other proprietary program swatches, but whether they use this, I don't think they do actually. I think they just all pass each other's Oh. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes, that would be very useful. Thank you. Does it? Okay. Well, that's good. Thank you. That helps. I was a bit worried because I was thinking we were going to produce something that no one could use. The last thing we have is device color. Remember I told you the sRGB, sorry, the SVG1 doesn't have device RGB or device CMYK or whatever, which often leads people to suggest that they can't do CMYK at all because they search the entire spec for the letters CMYK, don't find them and say, SVG can't do CMYK. And then we have to tell them about ICC. So we do have this. Why would you want it? For these sorts of things, you want to put something at the edge of your output that says this is 20% cyan or this is 50% gray and then your quality control stuff will be measuring that. That cannot be color managed because the whole point is that it's not color managed. It's the actual raw stuff that you're building your color with. Uh, we probably will have tint on that as well as, as a percentage so you can say device cyan and then a tint or something like that, it's particularly for, uh, for spot colors. People often want to do spot colors with a tint. However, as well as telling people in the spec, don't use this and this is what you really want, we also force a penalty on them. As soon as you try and use opacity with it, as soon as you try and overlay it with anything else or com combine it with anything else, it goes to the sRGB fallback and you lose because we really don't want you to be using this stuff saying, I know what CMYK means, just do it all for me, because that's not going to work. So hopefully that lets people that really need this produce it. Mm -hmm. No. Um, what we're seeing as for, at one point there was a thought that people might want to do that and particularly the everyone apart from Adobe crowd wanted to really push SVG towards being an alternative to PDF. That really is just not going to happen. There's an awful lot of stuff in PDF. It's improved a lot over the years. People aren't actually wanting that. What they want is an input format that goes, that gets, you know, collected together with some text and whatever and is spit out to PDF and goes to print. So it's not really trying to compete with, with PDF as an output format. No, I'm not sure, but that's what we're, we're not primarily taking that as a use case, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It may be. I mean, EPUB does specify using um, SVG already. Uh, and particularly in Japan, where something like 90% of all EPUB is used to produce manga, um, and, and it's a fixed layout. They don't, they don't do adaptive layouts that scale to different screen sizes. They do fixed aspect ratio, fixed size layouts. And they primarily use SVG for that, with maybe little boxes that are XHTML or something stuck inside. But the whole thing is done using SVG, but that is, that's a delivery format for screen, which is a bit different. And if they wanted to print that, I think that would go out again out to PDF. 
Anyway, okay, getting back to interpolation. Remember earlier I said that SVG1 had this problem that whenever you interpolate, it's sRGB, so any colors outside that have to get clipped in. Well, we now add some additional values. So you get LAB or LCHAB. So LAB, I told you, it has a lightness axis, and then it has two, an A and a B axis, which give you your colors. So you can actually treat that as a rectangular coordinate system and then have three values. Or you can treat it as a hue angle and then a chroma, which is how far out, sort of like saturation, but not quite. Um, and it's just one polar form and one rectang rectangular form. It's sometimes easier to see. If you're familiar with HSL or HSV, those do a similar sort of job. They have a polar type thing, so you have a hue angle. What it means is that you know, if you've got a slider and you're changing colors, instead of juggling sliders to try and get the color be right, you sort of track it around and say, well, I need a bit more orangey, so I move it this way. Oh, a bit more purpley, move it that way. A bit less saturated, pull it in. It's more intuitive for, for specifying and for manipulating. If you do um, interpolation in LA, LAB space, A, you get a nice gradient, and B, you don't get any gamma clipping because the space of, of LAB is technically infinite. Although in practice it's not, because it's very common to use 16 bits, and then that means you have a plus or minus one two eight type thing, and it it, it chops it. If you if you put a color uh, into LAB, say you went from I don't know photo YCC or or Adobe Color Space, you could it, bring it into Photoshop, change it to LAB, change it back. You've lost some of the colors around the edge. There are certain colors that can't be represented in that representation. LAB itself can represent them, but if you choose to skimp on bits, then you are going to lose some. So that's why I say if it does it well. But don't worry, we'll have a test in the test suite just to make sure that people do it well, because we'll make them fail if they don't. Yes, um, what, we, what we're planning to do for the tests, um, I'm, I'm thinking we need two types of tests for this. One is basically syntactic tests. In other words, here's a bunch of syntax, and if you understand it, then you produce green or something. But just that just proves that you parsed it, right? Rather than saying, I don't know what this is. It's not SVG1, I don't know what it is. And the second one is where you actually say, to pass, you need to produce this color. So you produce a reference color, you produce something else, and maybe two gradients that cross or something, and the intersection has to be this particular color. But then the question is, how accurately does it have to be to be a pass? It's not a binary thing anymore. If it, it has to be exactly that, you know, do you have to actually put a colorimeter on and measure them? What sort of tolerance are you allowed? If, if you've got a delta E of one, is it still the same color? If it's delta E of five, is it still the same color, etc. What I'm thinking there is that what we'll do is we'll have a separate suite like that with things you have to measure. And there's basically, you'll, you'll generate a report that has maximum and average errors. And that will be used in your conformance statement. You say, OK, I'm a medium quality implementation, and I got these values. And that means manufacturers can compete against each other on quality of implementation while having an open standard that they all implement. That's the plan. And certainly some of the companies that I've talked to that do sort of high-end print and whatever, that's actually what they want. That They're interested in SVG. And they want to know that the color stuff is good enough, it's enough stuff there, that they can produce a world-class implementation and then market it to their customers by saying, we do it best. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I think so, right, yeah. I think that's fairly easy to do. You, you just say the pass criteria, this color has to be similar to the color that's next to it or something like that. I think that's easy to set up. So yeah, here's some links. Currently, the color module is done as a separate module, and that's a link to it, which I'm editing. We recently resolved that the, the color module is actually going to move into SVG2. It's going to become the color chapter in SVG2 rather than be a separate bit. So it will move. 
uh, and there's a public mailing list which you can, which is archived, so you can look back on previous discussions. To write to that mailing list, you have to agree. You'll get a mail back saying, "Do you agree that your contribution is archived?" We have to do that because of our patent policy and because of people, you know, saying that, "Oh, I didn't know that you were going to put my mail out there." Or something. no one here is going to be surprised by the fact that an email archive, email archive exists, but some people are. So just letting you know. Um, so really, that's it. And if you have any questions, then feel free to email me. Um, chris at w3.org is my email. Uh, if you think of questions afterwards that you wish you'd asked here but you didn't, then that, that would be good. Uh, and really that's it. That's the end of my talk. So I'm happy to take questions. And big thanks to the water, Rich, because that really helped. Mm -hmm. You mean not? You mean not using um, a, a profile? Well, really, that's what we thought. For the LAB, you don't need a profile. You just give the, the values. And Richard suggested XYZ for, to cover the other case, so we'll probably add that. Um, but no, if, you, if you're wanting to use CMYK or RGB or something and, and say what it means, and you need to point to a profile. You only need to, I, I put them to, together there, but you only need to point to it once at the top of the file, like you would point to a script or a starship. You don't have to repeat that every single time. If you look what it's doing, um, Right, so it, there's a color profile element, and then the in, important thing there is a name, and that's a name that you make up, and with which you will refer to that profile throughout the rest of the file. Once you've got that name, you just say ICC, parentheses, name, the name that you made up, and the parameters that it needs. So you just reference it once to the head, like pointing to a script or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I think that's already possible. If you see, so if you want to use some other RGB color space, you just point to the profile for it, and then um, you, you use it. That is per profile. The way it's done like that. Then you'd need to have it twice and give it different names. Just say change the name. Yeah. Which, yeah, is, is something you would commonly want to do. Um, what I'm not sure about on this one is what happens if someone specifies um, rendering intent X and the profile they point to has rendering intent Y but doesn't have X for any combination of the, yeah. I'm not quite sure what to do there. Uh, whether it's okay to just, well, say, well, just use the one that it's got. But... Right. Mm. Right. Yep. Yes, that that is a point. I mean, in previously we've tried to avoid that sort of thing where things get out of sync. As an example, um, for text or for images where you have a text fallback, we tried to avoid, or, or for, t for graphical text that's using fancy fonts and whatever, we tried to avoid having like a glyph list like you have in PDF, and then having a text equivalent for accessibility, which as you say, just gets out of date and people forget to edit it. Um, hmm.
Right. The thing is, what what I expect is that Inkscape and Scribus start off will do that as soon as we've specified it and it's reasonably stable. And your your Firefoxes and Chromes and Operas and whatever uh, will go eh, and maybe do it later or do it a bit. Uh, Opera, in fact, probably won't do it until much later because most of Opera runs on mobile devices that don't. Actually, but this is a big thing. I, I've been developing this stuff for a number of years and. When I started doing it, no one wanted to know about color management at all because it was some highfalutin academic thing that wasn't actually used in the real world. Then it got to be something that happened on Apple devices. Then it got to be something that happened everywhere, and even Windows could do it reasonably well. Um, and it was great. You know, we were moving to a brand new world where all the, all the desktop and laptop devices all had color management, and now everyone's got little iPads and i whatevers and things and Samsung whatevers, and and none of them have color management on them. It's like we've is that we've gotten two big steps and then one back. And I'm not quite sure what to do about that. The mobile whatever world is becoming much more important and it doesn't have color management at all. Right. Yes. Right. I agree, and in fact a lot of these devices already have 3D type chips on them, partly to speed up video decoding, and those ones are already doing color space conversions anyway. You can also, apparently you can do 3D lookup tables using textures or something, uh, which would be quite neat. So yes, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is merely a temporary blip and that we go back up to having all the devices have some sort of color management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You, the un yeah, that's right. It depends on how much it, it feeds through to the underlying system. Right. Yeah. Well, Safari uses it on Apple. On Mac, on Windows, it. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what it does. I think it says, "Ha ha, it's Windows," and 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 doesn't. But there we are. Yeah, I mean, companies like Apple, they've usually made a big thing about color management, so it's kind of sad that their most popular devices don't have it currently, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to push them to, to ha adding it. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, yes, most printers use CMYK or some wider range of ink sets to actually produce the ink. So that that's true. Um, a lot of print drivers hide that, especially for inkjet printers that you would buy just to use in your home or in an office. They they behave as if they're an RGB device and they, they do the conversion themselves. So they're driven as... That's why, if by the way, if you buy one of the big x devices, you can get the level which does only screens, and then you get the level with another 500 euros that does screens and RGB printers, which of course there aren't any RGB printers, but printers which pretend they're RGB. And then if you play the mega box, then you actually get to profile print presses and stuff like that because they assume you've got scads of money. Um, or you could use Algal CMS and use the same device for all of them and get all of that. <clears throat> but yes, okay, so what I meant was not that you shouldn't use CMYK. What I meant was you shouldn't use mystery meat CMYK. In other words, hey designer, here's a CMYK file. What does it mean? I don't know, it's a CMYK file. Well, for what press? I don't know. In what country? Because, you know, the Americans use SWAP, and, and here we use Euroscale, and in Japan they use a different standard, and, you know, is it for coated or uncoated paper? All of which makes huge differences. And actually what happens with a lot of places, they insist on having a CMYK file, and then what, you know what they do with it? They take this huge CMYK raster, they bring it into Photoshop, and they whack it back to RGB again, and then they fiddle with it until it looks right, and then they convert it back to CMYK and make it print. This is what this is what people used to do before color management, right? There's, they would sit there with little dials, a bit yellow in the skin tones, and a bit more cyan over here, and, and, and they would fiddle with that, and, and they would get one run. They would go, they'd go like fine for half an hour, they go, it's going green, it's going green. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's okay. Okay, almost, almost. The, the profile for your monitor doesn't need to be in the SVG. Uh, what, what happens there is that the SVG renderer will look at your monitor profile and it will decide how, how to represent the colors that it finds in the file so they look the right colors on your monitor. But the SVG file itself doesn't need, otherwise every single person that looks at it would have to add their monitor profile, it wouldn't work, right? But what you have is the inputs. You've got this image from this camera that was exported in this format and it's using this RGB color space. You've got this thing that was came off a drum scanner, it's in CMYK and it's, it's for a Cytex press and it's this and it's that and whatever. You can bring that in and you'll be able to composite them together and put a little put overlay around it and do all whatever. Export it out. SVG basically combines all these graphical assets together, says how you want it laid out, and then it goes off to get printed. Uh, you make sure that the program that you're drawing it in actually says what color space it's using. It might be CMYK if you do it in Illustrator, or it might be RGB or whatever, but it needs to say what it's using. And it needs to put that information in the file, which is an ICC profile. What, as long as it's tagged, that will be fine. It should, it should just go through and it should stay. Now, it, for, for normal colors, like the color of the wood of this desk and whatever, things like that, those are inside the gamut of most devices, right? Neutral colors, no problem skin tones, this sort of thing. As soon as you get to violently zingy greens and whatever, these things have a tendency to be a way out of the edges. And so some devices can print them and some devices can't. That's what we mean by the gamut. It's like a three-dimensional volume that exp produces all the colors that it can actually represent. If there's a color outside, color management isn't going to help you. It can map it to the closest sort of a bit desaturated color, but it can't magically make it do something it couldn't do before. It just gives you a more consistent result. It means it, when you do a, 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 a range of grays, they look gray rather than being a bit green here and a bit purple here. So it, it linearizes and standardizes the things that it can, but it can't make it do something it can't do. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. Right. The, the, yes. Exactly. And that. And that's why a lot of programs let you do what they call soft proofing, where you, you instead of going these colors to my screen, you go these colors to some other device, and then including the gamut compression that it does, and then those colors to my screen. And typically, as well, what you'll do is you make everything that's out of gamut be like bright red or green or something, so you can see meet or flash. So you can see what you're dealing with and you can pull it in a bit because you as a designer can make a better decision about which, how, sh how much in should I move that so it fits most devices. Does that change results require me to make another change artistically to change these other colors as well? The printer can't make artistic decisions like that, right? The color management system can't do that. The best time to do that is when the designer knows, is aware of what's going to be at risk, changes the colors, mix the other changes, and then exports the result. Did that help? Okay, good. Okay, I guess that's it then.